Uh, my name is Jody Ploche. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So let's talk about your childhood, what you can remember when it comes to the good times, going back as early as you can remember. Uh, I look back on my childhood and I think it was all good times. Well, most of the times. Um, you know, as a kid, I remember being five years old and, and my older brother, who's 18 months older than me, starting to, to play tackle football. And I guess he would have been seven. I was five. And I wanted to play, but I was too young. So they made me the water boy. And, and the next year, at six years old, I started playing organized tackle football. I couldn't play basketball until I was eight years old. And then I was playing softball. And eventually, when I was like mm, probably nine, I started playing soccer. So that's what my childhood consisted of. It was basically sports. I would go from football season to basketball season to so softball season. And I think you had spring and fall soccer. So that's how I occupied my time as a child. Were uh, your mother and father together throughout your childhood? Uh, yeah, my mother and father were together throughout my childhood. I, so one of the, I don't want to say rumors, but one of the misconceptions is that my parents were divorced. My parents never got divorced. They were married to the day my father died. Um, but they did separate twice. Once in 1983, um, you know, my father, uh, I, I love the song Drinking Problem, so I, I kind of like read, look, look at it differently now because, you know, my mother felt my father had a drinking problem. My father felt it was a solution. Um, so, you know, my dad's job was a salesman, so his job was to entertain people, to take people out, buy them lunch, buy them drinks, and that was his job. But when he comes home drunk, uh, you know, and then, you know, wants to have a uh, intimacy um, that could create issues. I can see from a, a wife's perspective, but as a father, you know, he was our coach. He was at every practice. He was at every ball game. Um, but in 1983, um, due to my father's drinking, my parents separated. But after the events, I'm sure we're going to get to here in a few minutes, um, they got back together and they stayed together until 1991 when my dad started drinking again, because he went a period of time without drinking. And then when he started drinking again, my mother left him again um, until, I want to say 2007, uh, she moved to Biloxi and Katrina destroyed her. She lived like literally across the street from the Beau in an apartment. And Katrina just wiped that apartment out. Just the whole building, the whole, it was gone. And so she was living in a FEMA trailer and my little, little brother lives right across the street. And so he had had his second child and convinced my mother, look, we'll pay you more than you're making working at a bank answering the telephone we'll pay you more than that to come home and watch our kids and so she eventually moved back home so in 2005 i moved back to my dad who was the by himself so it was me and daddy in 2005 then 2007 moved back home so it was like they were roommates they were still alive because they were still married and uh you know that's how the current situation happened and so now it's now it's me and my mother's my dad's gone uh what, what were some of your hobbies as a child growing up hmm. uh i don't know if i had any hobbies as a child because it was from one practice or one ball game to the other so i mean if you want to include sports as my hobby and pretty much uh that was my main focus was, you know, the next ball game, the next practice. Uh, so just playing sports. When did you first start uh, taking karate lessons as a kid? Well, the funny thing about the karate is I didn't, I didn't care to take karate. I didn't want to take karate. I, as a matter of fact, when they handed out the flyers when I was in fifth grade, so what, I would have been 10, maybe, maybe into the night. No, I think I was 10. And, um, the flyer, they handed it to me. I balled it up and threw it in the trash can as I walked out the out of my fifth grade cl classroom. Well, my little brother, he had gone to another school because I think back then it was you had Jefferson Terrace was like kindergarten through second grade and Mayfair, where I was at, was third through fifth grade. So I was in fifth grade. My little brother was in second or third grade and he brought the flyer home. So when my mother saw that flyer she, from him, she was like, oh, he doesn't do anything. My little brother didn't play any sports. So she's like, this might be something he would be interested in. 
So she initially enrolled him, but when she enrolled him, she enrolled my older brother, me, and uh, our neighbor. She didn't enroll him, but her best friend enrolled her child, Mark. So it was the four of us that started taking karate from a guy named Rick at Jefferson Terrace. And uh, we went to one lesson, and, you know, it was unmemorable or, you know, it wasn't special. And then we went to the second uh, training, and Rick didn't show up. And so we thought Rick was a a hole because he didn't show up for the karate practice. He took the money and run. Well, our names were given to an up and coming karate instructor named Jeff Doucette. And he said, Look, we're going to honor your lessons. Um, you know, your names were handed over. And if you like it, um, you can continue on at you know, a particular rate. Um, and so we started taking karate from this young, up and coming karate teacher named Jeff Doucette. I know it was so long ago, but do you remember what your first impression of him was, if you do remember? Um, I, I remember that his studio, he had, cause he had actually like a karate studio dojo with mats, and heavy bags, and speed bags and jump ropes. And so he was more organized than Rick. Cause at Rick, we were in a, a playground of Jefferson Terrace. So it was more impressive to be at Jeff's karate studio than it was to be with Rick in the back, you know, backyard of a, a elementary school. So we thought that was cool. I mean, and then, I mean, he had the, with Rick, we were in our blue jeans and our T-shirt. With Jeff, you got there and everybody's got a karate uniform on. And so it, it, it seemed more up and up than what old Rick had going on. Do you remember how your father and mother got along with Jeff uh, while you were taking karate lessons? Uh, early on, they got along great. Uh, you know, one of the things that Jeff did was uh, he put on a – uh, it's a, a very personal persona, like, hey, I'm this really good guy. I'm really funny. Um, you know, he offered to you know, bring us home from karate practice, which, you know, to a mother of four, that's, you know, a godsend. Like, oh, yeah, sure, I can finish cooking dinner. Um, so at first, yeah, at, at first, everybody loved Jeff, and Jeff was, was kind of a part of the family after, you know, six, seven months. I mean, it was, we were around him so much. And like we'd have family nights on, you know, Saturday nights. Uh, my aunts and uncles would co- come over, our cousins would come over and we'd play. And uh, it got to the point where we'd invite Jeff over and Jeff would come along and, and play. I think at the time it was like password, eventually it became Trivial Pursuit, but you'd play a board game and watch whatever sporting event was on and the kids would be outside playing. So, I, you know, for a while, I mean, he was, you know, kind of family. So let's talk about everything that occurred after taking karate lessons for a while. As comfortable as you are, can you talk about everything that you went through as an 11-year-old boy leading up to March 16th, 1984? All right, so leading up to March 16th, 1984. All right, so we're taking karate. And, and again, Jeff would take us to karate tournaments in Houston, and we go to well, we go to the karate tournaments the night before we might go ice skating at the Galleria. Then we go to the karate tournament. And then that Sunday, we'd, we'd get up early and we'd go to Astroworld and we'd ride rides all day. And then, you know, in the afternoon, we got a you know, four or five hour ride home. So we'd leave around three, four o'clock. We'd get home at nine o'clock. And, you know, Jeff was fun to be around. He'd take us to the movies, take us to the mall. Uh, we'd go roller skating right, you know, less than a quarter of a mile behind the karate stu- studio was an ice skate rink. So we would work out in the summer. And we train our butt off. I mean, I can assure you, I was in shape as any 11-year-old was at that time. Uh, we'd jog five miles a day. We'd do jumping jack sit-ups, and we'd work out and practice our karate moves. And uh, at my 10-year-old self, I think, could have been my, Mike Tyson's 10-year-old self. But uh, so that part of being 10 years old was great. It wasn't until uh, Jeff made a business deal. So that summer of 1983, Jeff came up with this idea of like an LSU football tiger commemorative mug and a LSU bandana called a tiger rag. Well, my dad actually introduced him to a guy named Don Landers who owned some, owned some convenience stores around town and convinced him to sell the tiger rag bandana. Well, Jeff took the initial payment and didn't buy the bandanas. So when 
Jeff had to give up, you know, give the bandanas to Don Landers. He didn't have bandanas because he could he spent the money already. Excuse me. And uh, so that's why Jeff eventually left town. So in February, on February 19th, 1984, Jeff decided to leave town. And when he did, he decided to take me with him because I was had been his love interest for the past year. And do you, do you feel like he was grooming you up until that point in time? Oh, no, no, no. He had groomed me earlier on. So when we first started taking karate, but, you know, before, you know, he was invited on family weekends, um, he had been grooming not just me, but the family. So uh, he puts this appearance on that he was this great guy, you know, fun to be around, loved children, you know, oh, I just, he said he had an accident when he was a child, so he couldn't have children, so that's why he loved children so much. Um, and I guess in March of 83, a few months after we started taking karate, um, that's when he first started to test my boundaries. And what I mean by that, what, what child molesters do, um, for the uh, spoiler alert, he was a child molester, um, is they do subtle touches to normalize you know inappropriate sexual touch so the first time it came in my mind was we were driving i was he would let us drive his car he had like a two easy act it wasn't his it was his uh, quote-unquote girlfriend and uh he let us drive the car and it was a standard so he would work the st stick shift in the clutch and he'd let us sit in his lap and we drive and as i was driving he put his hands in my lap and started touching my private parts and, but it was such a a quick like it was just, it was there and it was gone. And it was just a, a way to see how I would react. He was testing our boundaries. And I think, like I said, in the ESPN E60, is a, I, I guess I passed the test because that's when once I didn't think about that touch and that's when he touched me more, which eventually led to him putting all sex on me for about a month. And then it led to a, a sexual relationship, which, you know, most people consider rape. So, <clears throat> can you talk about everything that transpired from him taking you up until um, you being um, rescued? All right, what transpired from him taking... All right, so on February 19th, 1984, he came by the house and he asked my mother to borrow the car. And his brother had a carpet company and one of the other karate students, his parents was building a brand new house a really nice house by the way like it's like a million dollar home right now um and jeff's brother was supposed to go install carpet so my mother said or so jeff told my mother can i borrow your car i need to go check to see if the carpet came in and so my mother was like sure and he's like jody come ride with me well my mother didn't think nothing of it i think she may have said don't keep him going all day or something and so we got in a car and we drove from baton rouge to gonzalez louisiana where his brother uh roland and mike lived and we went to mike's house first got some stuff clothes and a sleeping bag and then we started heading towards port Arthur, texas where his mother and sister lived and you know that's when he told me yeah we're going because he had, he had mentioned he might take me but it wasn't until february 19th where he's like yeah we're going and so we went to port Arthur, texas um he tried to get money to get a bus ticket to go to los angeles um so that sunday Jeff's mom called my mother and said that Jody's here with Jeff and they'll be home in the morning. So my mother was like, okay, tell him to get his ass back here as soon as possible. And my mother waited that Monday. We didn't show up. We actually went to Vinton, Louisiana. That's where Jeff's buried. And we went to see his uncle and his uncle must have given him the money to get the bus tickets to California. So we go back to Port Arthur that Monday night and Tuesday we went to Orange, Texas, and we took a bus from Orange, Texas to Los Angeles, California. But that Tuesday, that morning, my mother and sheriff's deputies, she called the, the sheriff's deputies, and they were headed to Port Arthur. So they literally missed us by about an hour. We left about 11 o'clock in the morning, and they got there around noon. How long, how long uh, were you gone with Jeff in Los Angeles up until you were rescued by authorities? We left February, Sunday, February 19th, and uh, it's, it's funny because we're in that time frame, right? what is it, February 5th day, so 
you know, we're in my kidnapping time. And uh, we left, I think, the Sunday, Monday. All right, so we left Tuesday. We got to Los Angeles around 6 or 5, probably 3 a.m. on uh, that Thursday night. We stayed at the bus station. We were going from February 19th. If you look at Jeff's uh, mugshot, his mugshot is February 29th, which I think is kind of cool because you only get February 29th every four years. Um, I was returned home March 1st, so I was going February 19th to March, March 1st. Do you know of any other children at the time that were being abused by Jeff? Yes. You want me to name them? <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 no. I was just, I was just curious no, um, no, if, no, if there no, were, no, if there are no, any no, others. No, I, I, no, I, I was an eyewitness to it, so it's not even a. As a matter of fact, um, I'm not too ashamed to say that he actually made us do things to each other. So uh, I'm 100 percent certain he was less than another kid. So, so were there other kids in Los Angeles with you two then? No, no, he just took me. The other kid was the one that I know of for sure was older than me. And so he had aged out like pedophiles. They like prepubescent children. And so this kid was older than me. So he had, you know, gone through puberty, you know, developed pubic hair. So he had aged out. So Jeff didn't want nothing to do with him. So that's why he was focused on me. And ironically enough, it was weird because the kid was, was kind of jealous of me, which seems weird, but there was a situation where we were on the bus ride to California where Jeff was like making out with this girl. Um, and I, I kind of felt like, you know, what is he doing? I, I kind of felt that sense of jealousy, like, you know, why is he making out with this chick, you know, when he's supposed to be, you know, in love with me? So at the so at the at the time when everything was going on, you felt like it was like a romantic relationship, and not knowing that you were being abused at the time is is that right? Well, I knew I was being abused. I knew what Jeff was doing was wrong, and I knew it was his fault, and I never blamed myself. But yeah, it was almost like it was a romantic relationship. I mean, he was possessive. He was jealous. He was like when my parents were split up, and I'd go to my dad's every other weekend. Um, you know, whenever I came back. home, home he'd be like you, know, you love your dad more than me i mean it's just guilt trips and and, and things like that so, so i mean he was not just a, a sociopath and a child molester but he was a manipulator and you know would try to do guilt trips and uh, he was just a total piece of shit actually so let's talk about the moment that you were rescued and jeff Doucette was transported back on a plane uh, to the airport and the infamous incident has been seen by millions of people online. Can you talk a little bit about that? All right. Well, so the, the, all right. So Jeff had been talking to my mother on the phone and saying to meet, meet us to New York. He was lying saying that we were in New York, that we were in Anaheim, California. And so he, he allowed me to call my mother and he said, just call your mother, let her know you're okay. And when I did, I think I'm pretty sure we were running out of money. I think Jeff had $6 in his pocket when he was arrested. So we were running out of money. He had paid for the hotel room that we were in for like a week up front. So it was coming towards the end of the week. And I, I think he intentionally allowed himself to get caught. So he let me call home collect. So I'm not trying to give kidnapping advice. Like if you ever do kidnap a child, I don't even know if they have collect calls anymore, but don't let them call collect. Or, or don't let them use a cell phone because they can ping the tower and find out where you're on. Um, that's my little kidnapping tip. But uh, he let me call home collect, and he was actually on the phone with my mother. I was in the bed in the little motel room sitting close to the – I was closest to the door. Jeff was closest to the wall over on this side. And I was we were I was watching one day at a time, and they interrupted it. I'd never seen the, the end of the show. And uh, I heard a knock, and then I heard a key. <laughs> Then the next thing you know, boom, they busted the door in. Cops busted in the, the hotel room. I'm the closest to the door. So the guns are on me at first. And the guns are on Jeff, just over here. And the cop walks in. And they're like, freeze, freeze, please, please. And the cop walks in around and looks at Jeff and is like, I ought to punch you in the GD mouth. He's like, I ought to punch you in the mouth. And they took me out. And that's the last time I ever saw Jeff. Jeff was up against the wall. You know, he had turned around, got in the, you know, I guess, frisk position, 
and uh, they took me out, and that's the last time I ever saw him. Did he did he say anything to you as you were leaving? I never, like I said, I they took me out of the room, and he he never walked by me. He never said anything to me because they took me out of the room. So, I, like I said, the last I ever saw him was up against the wall. They took me out. It wasn't like they walked him by me. He's like, "Don't say nothing, kid." Um, <clears throat> but that was kind of like the probably. I remember, I said my my childhood was pretty good. Um, this was probably getting into the worst of my childhood the next couple of weeks because from there I went to Anaheim Police Department and they questioned me for a couple hours. Um, I denied everything. Then I had to go to the hospital and they did a complete physical exam. They, they ran a rape kit on me. And then I went to like this uh, abusing the, like the child home for the day. And that was miserable. And about that night they came and woke me up. I had to go catch a plane at LAX. Um, my flight was like 1.15 in the morning. So I get on the plane. Now, I was actually excited about the plane ride because I'd never flown I'd never flown before. So I was all excited. I had a window seat. And, you know, so I've you know, got my face pressed up against the window. We take off and I'm looking. I can see all the lights and then we turn to you know head to Louisiana and all I had was the Pacific Ocean. So at 1 o'clock in the morning, there are no lights in the Pacific Ocean. I could look at the other side of the plane. I could see all the lights over there and then Eventually, it's the only time I've ever felt falling asleep on my airplane. I wish I could do that now. But uh, eventually, I asked for a pillow. I lean my seat back, you know, the, the two inches they allow you to go back. I put the pillow, and I, I fell asleep, and I wasn't awoken until it's like, you know, boom, prepare for landing. Uh, put your trays up and your seats up. And So the, the, the flight attendant, I guess they were stewardesses back then, the flight attendant woke me up, told me to put my seat up, took my pillow, and I remember looking out the window, and I can tell you exactly where I was at. I was uh, probably in Norco, Louisiana, going over the swamps. And I could look out and I could see the swamps as we were coming into our landing in uh, New Orleans Airport. So how long after you landed uh, did, did the uh, incident take place with your dad and uh, Jeff Doucette in the airport? Okay, so I flew back home March 1st into New Orleans and immediately, you know, I I went home and he had dyed my hair black. So my mother, her first concern was to get my hair back to blonde, which if you dye your hair black and try to get it back to blonde, she'd have been better off just shaving my head. Um, Jeff, uh, the officers went out to get Jeff uh, a couple weeks later. So Jeff wasn't brought back to the Baton Rouge airport. I flew to New Orleans, Jeff flew to Baton Rouge um, until Friday, March 16th, 1984. So it had been a good two weeks and a couple days. Uh, now, a week earlier, on March 9th, is when the hospital report came back. So I had lied and said that Jeff didn't touch me um, because I knew, I figured he was not going to get jail time. And then if he got out, he would come and be mad at me for telling on him. <clears throat> so um, I had lied. So March 9th is when Mike Burnett, the sheriff's deputy, if, if for those who have seen the video, he's the one that yells, why, Gary, Gary, why? And he goes and he grabs my father and keeps the other cop from shooting my dad. Um, he came to the house and he told my mother and dad that, that the hospital report came back positive of spermatozoa on the rectal slide. And so at that point, it, I decided once the hospital report came back, I decided I would tell the truth. So my mother picked me up at the bus stop that day, took me home, sat me down in the chair and was like, Mike Cornette came over and the hospital report came back and it was positive and i i pretended like i didn't know what that meant i was like well, what does that mean and she's like it means it means jeff fooled with you and i was like yeah he did and i immediately admitted and so so how long after the the sheriff had came over come over um to your house and and sat down and talked with your parents did the incident take place with your dad uh, in the airport and Jeff Doucette when he finally, you know, shot him when his flight landed? It was a week later. Um, of course, when my father, father heard the news, he said, I'm going to kill the son of a bitch. And, you know, Mike Barnett, he didn't think nothing of it. I mean, that's every parent's reaction. And so when Mike Barnett and Bud Connor went out to California to get Jeff to bring him back home, my mother was worried. And, and she told Mike, she said, Mike, I'm worried about Gary. And Mike's words were i've been protecting prisoners way before gary decided to become a hitman and so mike told my mother 
said, you ain't got to worry about it. Well, my mother that night, February, no, uh, Friday, March 16th, uh, my mother had been at her sister's house and she knew Jeff was coming home that night. So she left my, uh, my aunt's house and came home to watch the news. Well, as she got home, right before the news started, they did one of those teasers. And it was, uh, I think, unknown assailant guns down alleged kidnapper details at 10. Well, my mother knew exactly who did what and who was what. And so she, like, they didn't tell her beforehand, like, the cops didn't arrive till after she heard the news. And so she was upset. And when she talked to Mike Barnett, Mike was like, did you tell Gary? And my mother was like, no, I thought you did. And Mike was like, no, I did. And my mother was like, well, I'll find out. Gary will tell me who told him because my mother didn't tell him and Mike Barnett didn't tell him. Well, the news was trying to make it out that the, the police had somehow tipped off my dad that they would be walking Jeff to the airport which wasn't the case. And people to this day, I mean, I read things online. To this day, people still think the police told my father because my dad went to middle school and high school with Mike. But they, they were acquaintances, but they weren't friends. And my mother, uh, before she even knew my dad, dated Mike for nine months. So Mike, you know, was known to the family. So they just figured that Mike tipped my dad off. But it was a guy named Bob Shadell, who was a program director at Channel 2, WBRZ here in Baton Rouge, who <clears throat> ran my dad that Friday who ran to my dad that Friday and was like, Hey, when they bring your boy back? And my dad's like, Oh, I think he's back already. And he's like, no, he's not. And my dad's like, well, they ain't going to tell me. And he's like, I'll find out for you. So he went to the payphone, called the news station, said, Hey, when's you said scheduled to fly back home? And they said, Oh, it was flight scheduled to land at nine Oh eight. And so he told my dad, yeah, he'll be in at nine o'clock. Now, did he think my dad was going to shoot him? No. Did he think that my dad might go to the airport and start some type of, you know, conflict where that would make a good news story? I 100% believe that. And uh, that's how my dad found out. Someone from the news station told him. And he got fired immediately when they found out it was him. So after uh, Jeff got back to the airport, of course, everybody knows your dad shoots him. You know, he dies shortly after that. Do you remember what your reaction was at the time when you found out that your dad had shot and killed Jeff Doucette? I was upset that Jeff was dead. I was upset that my dad shot him. Um, you got to remember, one of the things that pedophiles do to, to keep children from uh, telling is, other than the sexual abuse, I had fun with Yeah, You know, we would, like I said, we would go to movies, amusement parks, um, or arcades. He'd, you know, he'd give me $10 and be like, here, go have some fun. And I'd go to an arcade and play, uh, you know, uh, sinister for an hour um so he was fun to be around so yeah so other than the sexual abuse i was upset because i felt like jeff was my friend i didn't want him dead now i will say this to this day to this day i wish daddy wouldn't have shot it now don't get me wrong i'm not too upset about it because everyone gets to watch jeff get shot and they, they've been watching it for almost 40 years and so it couldn't have happened to a better person but i still would have rather we're all gonna die we're all gonna die Jeff doesn't even know he's dead. I would have preferred Jeff to go to jail for the rest of his life because he made a threat. He said, he told my mother, if you don't meet me in New York City, you'll never see Jody alive again. So that right there turned kidnapping into aggravated kidnapping, which is life, no probation, no parole in Louisiana. And that's what they were going to get Jeff for. So I still to this day wish Jeff would have been sent to prison for you know the rest of his life. Um, but, you know, it makes a lot of other people happy to watch Daddy shoot him and get the justice a lot of people feel like we wouldn't have got it that he would have done that. After your father had shot and killed Jeff Doucette, do you remember the first time you got to speak to him after and what those words were that you guys exchanged? Ooh, you know, I have to go back to my book. Um, so having, you know, wrote a book, read, you know, read the book several times, we just came out uh, in November with the audio version. So I had to listen to the audio version you know, 10 times to make sure everything was accurate um again i was i was kind of standoffish like i didn't really i didn't really want to be around my dad um i think that that upset him and so i don't remember the interaction but i just remember i didn't want to be around him 
was it more like were you scared of him because he shot and killed him or was it more like you were just upset that he had killed your i guess uh quote unquote like friend at the time well i i probably was more upset about the fact that all right so no one knew about the sexual abuse because i i hit it you know i mean my mother knew the police knew daddy knew but my friends didn't know this was something i wasn't gonna go i mean i i'm in sixth grade i'm not gonna go and let everybody know in middle school because we know how how sensitive middle school kids are. Um, I wasn't going to let anybody know that, you know, I'd been sexually abused by some man. Um, well, when daddy shot him, everybody knew. I mean, so I was more mad about people finding out what happened to me because daddy shooting Jeff than probably anything else. Um, eventually, and I wasn't happy about this either, um, after the shooting, after my dad went to the middle, he went to a middle hospital for probably a month, um, they let him out. And when they let him out, my parents have been separated for, you know, eight, nine months that my mother let him back to the house. It, like they got back together. And so I was, I was upset about that because I was used to staying up till midnight, not going to bed, and, you know, well, when daddy moved back in, he tried to get structure. And I'm like, I've been doing it this way since nine months. I don't need you to tell me to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Um, one of the things though, that he started doing is he started doing maintenance projects. Like he started, he, we installed ceiling fans and we changed the, the floor in the kitchen. And so he started doing home improvement things just to kind of, you know, occupy his time. Um, again, the shooting took place in March 16th. He, he probably moved back in mid April. Um, and it wasn't until probably around June, July, August, sometime that summer that I fully kind of just everything got back to normal. I accepted my dad back as being my dad. I was always my dad's favorite. Um, and I remember we were walking down to the pool. We got a pool, you know, two blocks up the road, the neighborhood swimming pool. And then we were walking up there one night it's in the evening. And I just remember saying, Hey, look, I don't blame you. You know, I, I'm not mad at you anymore. You know, we, we're good. And I think that meant a lot to him because then he was, and, and then after that, we just had a normal father son relationship. Can you talk about the legal process that your father went through after the shooting death of Jeff Doucette? Um, it's funny because, you know, being a kid at the time, I didn't understand the whole legal process. And, and going back and doing research for the book, um, I, I didn't realize at the time that daddy wasn't indicted until like nine months later. And the reason being is because, one, you had a DA's election that in 1984, that, that fall coming up. Um, and also they didn't want the grand jury that indicted Jeff to be the same grand jury to indict daddy. So they waited until they seated a new grand jury before they presented the case in front of daddy. But again, it was such a sensitive case because the, the DAs were running and the, and the whole race was like, what are you going to do with Gary Poshet? And no, no DA wanted to say, well, I'm going to seek life. I'm going to put that SOB in jail for the rest of his life. Cause a lot of people in Baton Rouge, most of the people in Baton Rouge were like, you shouldn't even arrest him in the first place. You know, give him a key to the city and pat him on the back. So that all, you know, as a kid, I'm not thinking about all that, but that all that was going on in this whole situation. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a very, I don't want to say sensitive subject, but it was a very discussed topic for over a year. I, I mean, I think Daddy was mentioned on the news every day for almost a year um, in town because, because, again, he wasn't indicted until nine months later. Um, then he fired his lawyer. He had to get a new lawyer. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of crazy. So at the time, right after the shooting, would you say that it might've brought you two closer together or perhaps driven you two apart at the time? If you take away the, let's say the, the, the window from when my mother and my father separated in the summer of 83 till the summer of 84. Um, if you take away that, take away that year, I would say it was no different. I mean, my dad was my dad before Jeff and, and after Jeff, he was, it was the same. Like I, I didn't feel any different. He was daddy. How would you describe what kind of person your father was to somebody who has never met him, but has seen the footage? Uh, 
Not that guy. He was. He was a kind, gentle, loving. He was a good guy. He was. Sorry. Every. Everybody loves the guy in the video. But he was better than that. He was a good guy. Sorry. Oh no, you're fine. You're fine. Were you were you too close up until his death in 2014? Yeah. Yeah, we were very close. I know you spoke a little bit about uh, your book, Why Gary, Why, but can you go into uh, depth a little bit about it, what it's about, you know, where people can find it, so on and so forth? All right. So in 1993, I was at North Lake College in Irving, Texas. I just finished my uh, English composition writing class. And so I was like, you know what? I'm ready to write my book. I made a B. So I was like, I'm good. Um, so I started in the computer lab. I just sat down and started writing. Yeah, like I said, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I, I strung together 27,000 words. So I had several chapters. And uh, I decided in 1994, the beginning of 94, that I'm going to move back home to Baton Rouge to finish the book. And so when I moved back home, trying to finish the book, I realized I didn't, I didn't have enough information. Like, I wasn't ready to finish the book. So I re-enrolled back at LSU. Um, I ended up graduating in 1997, and in 1998, I got a job in uh, uh, Norristown, Pennsylvania, at a place called Victim Services Center in Montgomery County, Incorporated, and I worked there for seven years. I was a supervisor of community education programs for five years. Um, all seven years, I was a certified sexual assault counselor. I had eventually trained uh, new employees to be certified sexual assault counselors, and so it was then when I moved back home in 2005, well, it wasn't even then, um, but that experience kind of gave me the knowledge I felt I needed to finish the book. So in 2017, um, I hired a, a book writing company to help me write the book. And so we talked for about six months, um, probably once a week for an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And they're getting information and they're going to write the book. So I think it was September of 2017, me and my mother went to her 50th high school reunion in Taos, New Mexico. And as we were driving there, they sent me the original copy, the, the original first draft of what they wrote of the book. And I didn't like it. I didn't think it was, it, it was, uh, it didn't tell the story. It didn't go in depth. It was, it was more like a self-help book. And, I didn't know how to tell them I didn't like it. So I went back and I was looking for this one chapter that I wrote. Cause like in, okay, let's see if that's 2017, probably 2013, 20, 2014, I decided I was going to just start over, write the book from scratch. Well, I was looking for the chapter that I wrote and it, actually the chapter was really good. I should have included it in the book or, or some form of it in the book. Um, and I found what I started writing in 1993. And so I took what I wrote in 93, the 27,000 words, and I sent it to the book writing company. And I said, mix these two together. And if you read the book, you can almost tell the different writing styles. You can kind of see, all right, this is what Jody wrote. This is what the book writing company wrote. But we were able to blend it. And it actually came out better than I think. I mean, it came out. Uh, it's got a lot of information for parents. It's got a lot of information for uh, victims and for people who are just kind of just naive on the subject. It will give you a lot of good information as far as what to look for, um, you know, how to protect your children. So it, it, it came out better than I hoped. So finally it was published. And uh, I think it's officially August of 2019. I held off on the promotion of it till after Labor Day. That's when I hired like the marketing company for a month. Um, and then I booked 
several speaking engagements, and then COVID hit. And so I'm just now getting back to where I'm doing uh, speaking engagements. I got one coming up uh, in April in Richmond, Virginia. I just did one uh, last month, no, earlier this month, February 2nd, in uh, New Orleans, which went really well. And so now things, things are getting back to normal. But uh, you can get the book on Amazon. I have, uh, you can get a paperback. You can order a paperback. You can order an audio book because we just came out with that in November. Or you can get a digital book. You can get a Kindle version of it. And I, I'm a Kindle fan. As a matter of fact, I'm doing this interview on my Kindle right now. Um, you know, I love Kindles. Um, but those are the three ways that you can get it. But I guess there's a fourth way. You can email me. And if you want a signed copy, um, if you're in the United States, uh, the book's 20 bucks. Um, if you want a signed copy, it'll be 25, um, you know, $5 for shipping and handling, but you know, just email me and I'll, I'll send. So let's say somebody is listening right now. That's a, a survivor of domestic violence or sexual abuse. What would be some, uh, coping mechanisms that you would, you know, give somebody that, was at one point in time in your shoes that is still recovering and still having a hard time? Well, I recommend seeking support. Now, when I say seek support, there are several forms of support. You know, I mean, my support was my mother. Um, I tell people a lot of times, I would recommend maybe get like professional help is, you know, sometimes family members aren't the best uh, forms of support. You know, family members are like, you know, suck it up, walk it off, you know, rub some dirt on it. Where if you talk to someone who's trained as a, as a counselor, you know, empowerment-based philosophy, you know, options, you know, uh, a lot of times victims doesn't, the victims don't know. For example, when I was in the hotline, I got a call from a high school girl and she had gone to a party and she had done some drugs, probably smoked weed. Um, she had done some drugs at the party and she was raped. And, you know, she called three days later. And I was like, well, you need to go to the hospital to get a rape kit done. And she's like, I can't because I don't have, if I do, it'll show up on my parents' insurance. And, you know, my parents have put me in rehab and I don't want them to know that I've been to a drug. And I told her, I was like, well, if you go to the hospital, the state will cover the cost. So it won't go on your parents' insurance. Um, you know, they will call the cops, but you don't have to talk to them. Um, someone from our agency can meet you at the hospital to walk you through the process. And when she had that knowledge, she didn't know that the state would cover the, the cost. But she was worried about the interest. So she went and got, got help. Um, so we just, you know, provide informed uh, options and, and let the victim decide what's best for them. So uh, that's uh, what I would say is, is seek some type of help, whether it's professional or whether. I mean, and again, I'm not a religious person. I know my dad did his community service at the church. Um, but I mean, it could be a clergyman. It could be a pastor. It could be a priest. Um it could be a counselor. It could be a best friend. I mean, just whatever support there is, seek it and, uh, you know, do what's best. So before we get out of here, is there anything that you'd like to talk about and or end with that we haven't covered yet? Ooh, wow. Um, well, one of the things that I like to point out, like, so whenever I do interviews and I ended my book the same way, is that uh, I did a speech in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and I followed the year earlier. It was a night of remembrance for like victims of uh, homicide and murder and crime, and and the year earlier was the coroner who had identified all the victims from Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania on September 11th. So I'm following this guy, right? Well, the brochure had a quote from Helen Keller and in the last line of my book is the world is full of suffering, but it's also full of the overcoming of it. And so that's my main message is that, you know, though you went through something as horrific as sexual abuse, that you're not scarred for life. You're not damaged goods. You're not ruined. Um, you can with the proper support be okay. Without the proper support, you can be a mess, but if you find the proper support, you can be okay. You can overcome. And, you know, we only have one life to live and make the best of it. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for giving me your time today. I've been following the story for a long time, and I'm uh, glad that we finally got to sit down and do this.